Hello, everyone, and welcome to the JS Held podcast. My name is Sarah Richter, and I have the honor of working with these incredible women who are part of today's discussion. Let me first thank our panel of special guests for joining us and also introduce Monica Christopher, our Chief Marketing Officer, who will be leading the discussion. Everyone, thank you and welcome. Let's start with introductions. Hi, everybody. I'm Monica Christopher. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at JS Held. I've been with the organization for a little over six years, and I'm based out of Tampa, Florida. Delighted to be here today. Diana. Hi, thank you for the invitation. I'm Diana Costa. I'm VP Global Head of Quality and Process Operations, and I'm based in Houston, Texas. Hi, my name is Paula Essek, and I'm a forensic accountant, and I sit here in Illinois. Oh, hi, I'm Jenny McNulty, and I'm also a forensic accountant, and I'm in Los Angeles, California. I'm Aubrey Shea. I'm a senior vice president and the practice lead for our forensic accounting insurance services division. I'm based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Hi, I am Allison Stock, and I am an epidemiologist and toxicologist. I am the health sciences service line leader for within our environmental health and safety practice, and I'm based out of New Orleans. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Wolfarth. I am the practice lead for our forensic architecture and engineering practice group. I myself am a civil structural engineer, and I am based in Maryland. Wonderful. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. Um, many of you have probably heard the quote, surround yourself with women who would mention your name in a room full of opportunities. I love that quote, right? You always want to surround yourself with your people, people that lift you up. And I am so extraordinarily honored to be here and to work with you all every day. And I'm looking forward to the next 40 minutes or so to get to know your stories a little bit better. So the first question I wanted to ask, I'll direct towards Diana. Um, Diana, how did you get started in your field? What made you choose this profession? So when, when I was in high school, I did have two career choices. One was economics, the other one was civil engineer. I always fell in love with the financial reporting, the depth of information that that provided. Um, also welfare economics was just like an amazing field for me. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, I always loved math. Um, to me, math is everywhere. There are numbers everywhere, forces, vectors. That's what I see when I walk. And I decided to, to actually pursue that career into the numbers. So I ended up becoming a civil engineer. And funny enough, I ended up doing civil engineer as a degree and marrying an economist. So I get best of both worlds. There you go. Well, good. If you ever get bored, I'm sure Aubrey will be looking looking you up in the employee directory and calling you up to see if you want to switch over the financial services <laughs> side of things. Um, Aubrey, how about you? How did you get started? Yeah, um, I actually started out going to school for forensic science and was convinced that science was the route for me. I um, loved science in high school. And then about a semester in, I quickly realized that science in college is not the same as science in high school, but the numbers clicked. So similar, the numbers were where it was at for me. I loved accounting. I switched after the first semester and, you know, I actually came across forensic accounting on a whim. I found my prior firm by Google search. I submitted my resume for an internship and really I've been passionate about it ever since. And the rest is history. Here we are today. That's a pretty cool story. I like how when you look back, you know, I remember hearing a Steve Jobs commencement speech where he said you can't connect the dots looking forward, but when you look back, you can see how you ended up in your career. So it's interesting that both you and and Diana maybe had different aspirations and then and ended up in your um, in your intended field. So, Allison, I'm going to um, ask you the next question because you have such an interesting job and poor Allison has been on the receiving end of way too many texts for me during the COVID pandemic. And I'm sure I'm not the only one blowing up her phone, but what you do is so fascinating and it's it's such a different um, different angle to, I think, a lot of the science that a lot of us are familiar with. How did you get to where you are today? What's the most challenging part of your what, what you do? I'd love to hear more about your story. 
So I actually have a similar story to everybody else, but I wanted to be a solid gold dancer. So I'm going to date myself <laughs> on what my career aspirations were. Um, and actually, and I was a dancer. I danced all through um, high school and college, but I was lucky enough to get a start in a lab when I was 16. So I, I had a friend who recognized that I really liked science and I stayed within science. But I've had a meandering career to get to where I'm at today. Um, as I mentioned, I have a, a background in both toxicology and epidemiology, but I also hold a master's in occupational health. And I had a really great experience um, between my master's and my PhD at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, where I worked on probably one of the things that I, besides working at 9-11, um, the work that I did at NIOSH, where we actually worked with the Consumer Product Safety Commission and had them um, take off three-wheeled ATVs because of child fatalities, was, as a public health practitioner, that was one of my best things ever, that, that it was the data I collected that led to that being changed, and now all ATVs are four wheels here in the United States. So it was a pretty big deal. Um, but, you know, I, I would think that the challenging part is trying to figure out where you want to go and how you're going to get there. And I was just very lucky that I had very strong mentors, both women and men who took an interest in me early on and helped guide me because I was pre-med. I am probably not the right person to be your primary care physician because I tend to say to my kids, unless there's more than a cup of blood, I really don't need to know about it. So, um, you know, I'm not necessarily have the most compassion on some of those things that maybe you wouldn't see as a, as a family practitioner, but I do have a lot of compassion as a public health practitioner. And so I've been able to channel that work that I did in my graduate school and spent some time at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and then went into private industry. And I somehow gratefully landed in this great career at JS Health. Well, we're excited to have you, and you can expect a giant poster of Andy Gibb for your next birthday gift. Thank you. I actually <laughs> had that album, so yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Emily, we were um, we all got to get a little glimpse into some of your background through the JS Held LinkedIn post, and your story was not only inspirational, but it made me a little emotional reading it with a great story about your grandfather. Tell us a little bit more about some of the challenges that you've faced professionally and how you've overcome them. Yeah, so thank you. So, so what Monica's referring to is, is my grandfather. Um, he was a physicist and chemist. He actually developed the catalyst that turns crude oil into gasoline, has 11 other patents to his name as well. Um, so I was so lucky from a young age. He took me under his wing and we'd spend weekends together and summer vacations together and spring breaks together, just working on math and physics and chemistry and algebra and calculus problems. So I always felt confident in, in class and um, it helped me to just gravitate more toward, toward the math and science fields where Questions were either they were right or they were wrong, the the answers you would supply. And um, it would always frustrate me and some of the other subjects how you'd get kind of a nebulous review with a B slapped on a paper, whether it was English or history or Spanish, or it you never knew quite where you stood or or what was incorrect and what wasn't. Um, math and science was always, it was just crystal clear. It was this is this is the the right way to do it. This is the formula, and it's as simple as that. Um, Engineering itself, I would say in college, it was hard. And I don't think there's there's any other way to describe it, that it was a challenge even getting through the the college program. I went to University of Maryland and I remember at one point in, in my college career, I actually walked over to the astronomy building and made an appointment with their dean. And I said, hey, I'm in engineering right now. I'm looking to switch over to astronomy. You know, give me your sales pitch. He was like, no, no, if you got into the engineering school, stay there. Don't come over to astronomy. You would, you would hate yourself in 20 years. Just keep doing what you're doing and don't come back here again. Just keep plugging away. And I was actually at University of Maryland last night for a basketball game. And we drove past that astronomy building on our way to the parking lot. And I just, I laughed at that story and remembered it and thought, I am so glad that Dean sent me away because... The degree was challenging, grad school was challenging, and the day-to-day -day work is challenging. But at the end of the day, it's all worth it 
and being surrounded by a supportive, responsive, quality team uh, makes what could be a really tough job seem super easy. Thanks, Emily. Paula, anything you might have to offer there in terms of challenges or you know what brought you down the road and down the path where you are today? Okay, well, basically what I wanted to be was a kindergarten teacher. And I think a lot of you who know me know that one of the things that I'm good at is explaining things. And so ultimately, when I realized that maybe a kindergarten teacher wasn't the highest paid position because I went to a, a Catholic school and so therefore they were probably paid about 25 grand at that time. Um, I decided that I wanted to fall back into my math and science, which was something that I was good at. Um, both my parents had sort of a bookkeeping background. And so therefore, in high school, I was taking honors physics and probably would have been sitting next to Emily and Allison in, in their classes. But at the same point, I was also taking bookkeeping, which was against the norm. Um, in school, you either went college or business. And when they termed it business, when I was in school, it was more of a secretarial or bookkeeping. And so... Once I realized that I liked the bookkeeping aspect, I said, well, now I know what I want to do in college. And so I started in accounting and I did an internship and I ended up with Bruno and 30 years, 32 years later, here I am. That's so. pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a great story, Paula. And we also know that you have some mad design skills because I've seen some of the PowerPoint decks that you've put together. <laughs> Jenny, um, you joined us. Uh, I guess it's been about two years now, right? Has it been almost two years? Almost, yes, almost two years. That's that's pretty wild. And I was so excited when um, the Legacy VWM team joined JS Held um, because there were so many women leaders at your firm. Tell me what it was like working in a male-dominated industry, but working in leadership, and what kind of change have you experienced in in your field? Um, I'm just laughing because I think the male dominated industry, um, this is a funny story. I'm probably revealing too much, but I'm going to go for it. Um, um, David Weiner and I were partners and there's another individual, Ted Vavula, so the two males. And, um, they decided to ask me to become a partner and I was very excited and I had just had my first baby. And, um, so I came back to work and they were very excited. I came back to work. And then, um, totally unbeknownst to me, I got pregnant again. And so as we're negotiating this, um, I was a little emotional because I was pregnant and I found out I was pregnant with triplets. And um, so they were, we were all talking together and they were like, just come on, Jane, let's get this through. And I, in the middle of the conversation, started crying. I burst out in tears and the two of them did not know what to do. They were so disarmed because they've never seen like a woman. <laughs> and I said, I want to be partners, but I just found out I'm pregnant with triplets. And the two of them all fell off their chairs. They didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I was like, I want this so bad. I worked my whole career to be like this partner and God blessed me with a pregnancy of triplets, which I was unplanned for. And, um, so it was just funny because it was just, I said, I always tell people, if you wanted to disarm a man, start crying in front of them because they did not know what to do with me. They were just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Okay, too much information, but I gave it to you all. So I was very lucky to um, like accounting as a kid. And I remember my um, freshman accounting teacher, Mr. Zeman, told me I was good at accounting. And I was like, what does that even mean? You know, and I had like 105% in his class. Um, so I kind of stayed on that track. I ended up going to college and getting my CPA and working for one of the large auditing firms. But when I went to that first day on the job, that large auditing firm, I just knew it was not for me. It was way too boring and I couldn't express my personality. And so, as you said earlier, Monica, the dots, I didn't realize how the trail would get me back to where I'm at right now. But the job that I do, which is, um, you know, testify as an expert witness in economic damages, is the job I would have created if I, if I, it was job I, I was meant to do. And it's, uh, it takes all my pluses, all my strengths, my analytical strengths, which I really enjoy, but also lets me, my personality kind of shine through. So I'm just very fortunate that um, my pre my uh, previous partner, Ted Vavolis and I happened to be Greek and we went to the same church and that's how I got started in this. That's how random careers start. So that's that's my story. 
Jenny, I love your story. And, you know, as moderator, I still prepared answers to the questions myself. Um, and when I was thinking about what's the most challenging part of getting to where we are today, that one question, the one thing that resonated with me was authenticity and being who you are, because a lot of times working in a male dominated industry, you think, you know, I have to be serious. I, um, I can't show too much emotion. And how, what is my personal brand and how do I, how do I get taken seriously? And what I loved about your story was the authenticity, right? Like you cried and it, it's what it's, and I think that there are some people on this call that were probably at one team meeting that I hosted. I had, I was growing a team at JS Held and I was hosting a team meeting all day and a team dinner and I got a phone call from my son and he was hysterically crying at sleepaway camp and I started crying and I walked out of my team dinner and I drove two hours to go pick him up. And the next day I was paralyzed with this fear that I was weak or I'd shown weakness that I'm a leader and I'm hosting a team dinner and my team saw me cry and I left. And the next day I found that I was surrounded not only by my women colleagues, but my male colleagues who just gave me props, lifted me up, said, you know, you're a mother first, and that's why you're such a good leader and why you're a great manager. And that one experience showed me that, you know, you have to be true to yourself. You have to, um, your personal brand is who you are, and it has to be authentic. And I love the fact that you just shared that story. I love the fact that you cried, and I love the fact that it terrified them. <laughs> I think that that's great. That's awesome. Any other stories to share about challenges or personal brand authenticity, Diana? Yeah, no, and if I can add um, some comments into that, I think everything goes back to determination. So uh, years back, yes, it was a boys club. And as women, we were all trying to be part of the boys club because it was male dominated. A lot of things have changed, but on my personal experience, I am first generation college graduate. I was born in Colombia. I'm a Spanish native speaker. Um, I'm a woman, so everything is against me, right? You could say all of the odds are against you. Uh, and on top of that, I'm trying to conquer a world that is male dominated in a country that is not my own country by, by birth. Um, so I think determination is everything. It's what are you dreaming of? Uh, believing in yourself, like you're saying, Monica, being authentic, who you are, and it's just showing your true self. Um, and and on top of that, it's just being passionate. If you love what you do, you transmit that in your words, in your actions, in, in your everyday work. So I, I think that's the most important thing. It doesn't matter if they're telling you like this is male dominated or this, this could, whatever obstacle can be. If you have the determination and the drive, in the thrive, you, you'll get across and, and you accomplish things. Absolutely. Allison, you had some thoughts to share? I was just going to also reiterate Diana's comment on determination, because I don't know if it's happened to anybody on this phone, but I've been in my career and twice now in my career, I've had um, people say, I can't do something because I'm a woman or because I'm a mother. I, I distinctly remember sitting in an office for, in one of my previous jobs and applying for a position for an overseas position. And it was a 30 day on, 30 day off rotation and having somebody say, no, you can't do it because what are you going to do if your kid gets sick? And my comment was, well, I have three children and I have a husband um, and I have family support around me. So I, I'm going to continue working. I'm not going to try to fly home to the States. And that was such an unusual answer for someone to, to give them, right? Because they kept thinking that I'm just going to give up and leave. And I didn't, I ended up not taking that job. I actually took a better job, but I think Diana hit the nail on the head that even though there's more women coming into the workforce and to some of the careers that we're in, determination is what's gonna get you where you need to be. Oh, those are great thoughts. Determination, I would say support from your, from your colleagues too. Um, I never take for granted the fact that I am working in an organization that I believe is firmly dedicated to a culture of um, allowing people to have personal lives and and allowing the concept of work-life balance. And I've always worked for a leader here who has supported that. And I think that it's so important to um, find organizations 
that do that for you and create that environment. And Allison, I love that you said you you said no to that job and you you, you found a better one. That, that's pretty cool. Aubrey. Yeah, to reiterate the, the balance, to me, that's one of my biggest challenges and I, I truly work on it every day. Um, but it's also one of the reasons I was so excited to join JS Health. Um, so I feel like as women, we have so many expectations, you know, and can we be the accountant? Can we be the good friend and the mom and whatever else we have to be that we've all put on ourselves? Um, and, you know, can we have it all, right? Can you have it all? And I, I truly am a firm believer that we can, but we don't have to do it all ourselves. So to your point, Monica, finding that support system, knowing that you can rely on others in your, in your, that you're working with, that you're peers with, your friends, whatever balance you need to do, that's what I really think like we need to strive for because that's that's who we are, right? We're, we can be all these things. We can meet every expectation that we want to with a great support system around us. That's great. Thank you for adding that. So um, I want to shift gears a little bit. I think this has been such a great conversation. Um, one question that you know I want to share with those who are listening right now is, what does success mean to you? And I think Aubrey just shed a little bit of, of light on that, right? That I think historically success might be divine, defined by a job title or success could be defined by compensation. Am I making more money than I did before? But I think the definition of success is changing for people in general. And I'd like to hear from some of you, what does success mean to you? And um, what have you done to get closer to your definition of success? I think for me, what success means finding a job that you really like, what you love. Because I mean, I love what I do, so I really don't have the Sunday mo the Sunday night blues or anything like that. Of course, there's days where your clients, you know, you wish things worked out differently, and you wish you did things differently. I'm not saying it's it's always rosy, but I said I enjoy it. It doesn't feel like a job. Uh, as much as it would if I did not enjoy it. And so I tell my kids all the time, like, everyone's given a talent. Everyone's given something. And it's your job to figure out what you're good at that separates you from the pack. Um, and so I think that's what makes you successful is that if you're happy in your job and, like, you know, if you're happy in your life, then you're just generally happy. And that's what I found the most success in my career. Because um, this is I've done this now for 20 years. And before that, I had two other big jobs that I enjoyed, but I did not love. And I did have Sunday, Sunday night blues. I'm like, oh, it's Monday. And I don't feel that way at all now. So, you know, that's my, that's my advice. Yeah, that's a great definition of success. Success to me is just an ephemeral concept. If you want to measure success, it's just being able to wake up every morning and feel happy. I'll have a smile in the face because of what the day is going to bring, because whatever you know, it's going to happen. So that, that would be a wonderful measure for success. And I will say, professionally speaking, if you want to, if you want to want to ask yourself if you're being successful is, do you feel passionate about what you do? Do you really love what you do? That would be the best measure. And it could even be just uh, like the grandma brownie recipe. If you have it to perfection and it makes you happy and it draws a smile on your face, that's a measure to success. So it, it, it works for every single thing that you do in life. Absolutely. Emily? And I think something you need to look at when you're looking at your success is, is the impact that you have and, and has anyone else benefited from your success? So pursuing a, a education and a career in engineering, I never had many examples ahead of me, above me to show like, hey, that's what I want to be. I want to be that woman. I want to be that female. I want to be that girl. There was just nothing there. It was just a bunch of a bunch of men. And um, I, I think of since there was no one ahead of me in the engineering field that I could look at and kind of keep it, my eye on the prize of that's what I wanted to become in you know, 20, 30 years. Um, I hope that maybe I can become that. So I like looking behind and seeing, even just hearing one of my mom's friend's daughters is gonna pursue engineering because of a conversation we had together, or one of my neighbor's children's is pursuing math and science because I spent the summer working with her and tutoring her in her algebra class. And 
um, it, it's kind of like looking back to see what 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 was it all for and what did it all mean to to those outside of your just yourself. Allison, you had a comment to share. I think also piggybacking on what Emily just said is one of the things I've been fortunate enough to be able to do in my career is to mentor um, people, whether when I was at the government, whether I was in private industry and even coming into consulting. And I had one of the best things happen to me uh, right after Thanksgiving, one of my students and uh, came to visit on a, on a trip through New Orleans on the way to Texas. And I got to spend some time catching up. And it was great to spend some time catching up because this is someone that I've still kept in contact. And I met this this person when they had just graduated college. They were still trying to figure out what they were going to do with their lives. Very unclear. And I got to spend a summer with them. And then they stayed, right? They came as a, an intern and then I got them a permanent job. And they stayed with us for three, about three years when I was at CDC, when they went back to nursing school. And now they have a very successful career, but they're still in public health. And it's really rewarding to me to know that 28 years later ish, I still had an impact on someone and they're still making the world a better place. And just like Emily said, you know, looking backward and having that, that opportunity, that's where you get your success from. Absolutely. One thing I wanted to add, you know, um, when we talk about the definition of success and challenges that we face along the way, and when we look back and connect those dots um, in the rear view mirror, you know, Diana, you talked about happiness and determination. You know, one thing that I remind myself is happiness is a choice, right? We work in a fast paced organization. Things are happening rather quickly, nothing, nothing stays static around here. And it, it can be easy, regardless of where you work or what challenges you're facing, whether it's in school or professionally, to have that a good attitude. And you mentioned passion and, and to choose happiness and to look on the bright side. And I think that's how you avoid the Sunday blues. I think it's really easy to get sucked into what's not working well, what could be going better, what choices could I have made that would have been better, but um, to give yourself some grace and to look on that bright side and to choose that path of happiness. I think that that's what avoids the Sunday blues is you, you just go into it with, with a good attitude and then no matter what you're doing and if you're working with the right people, you will be successful. You'll find a way. It won't always be easy. Um, there won't, there, there'll always be roadblocks. Th things will change and there'll be challenges. But I think that just making that conscious choice of happiness um, will result in, in success. And, and you're yeah. completely right, Monica. I, I am going to share a thought that's going to make me look like the worst mom in the whole world. Um, but when I started traveling a lot, my kids were, were little and they would cry all the time. Mom, I don't want you to leave. I'm going to miss you so much. And I embedded to them since a very young age that happiness, it's a choice. That we can be happy when we are together, but they can be happy by themselves. They can be happy with their friends. They can be happy with their dad. They can be happy in any situation. And it's their choice to be happy. So let's let's enjoy every time that we have together and let's be happy together. But if mom's not home, you can still have the choice and you can still be very, very, very happy. You don't need to have somebody next to you, call her your mom or your partner or whomever to be happy. It's a choice. Thanks, Diana. I agree. Good, good life lessons, I think, at work and at home right there. Um, any any advice to give to young women who are probably embarking on making some decisions as to where they want to go professionally and making maybe personal choices? Maybe they just found out that they're pregnant with triplets and don't know what to do next, right? Any advice for um, young women professionals as they as they embark on their next phase? I would say that um, my advice kind of goes along with the happiness is that you're not going to win every day at work and you're going to make mistakes and clients aren't always going to be happy with you. But um, my husband always reminds me that I always remember the client that didn't like me and I forget about the other hundred clients that loved me and that sent me emails and called me and couldn't say enough good things. But I said, but I know, but why did that one client not like me or why, you know, and he's like, you can't focus on the negative. And, um, 
that's what I try to do. And, you know, um, as, a, as a testifying expert, I go into court and I remember um, my previous partner, Ted, told me, he said, you're going to get off the stand. And I promise you, every time you get off the stand, you're going to wish you said something. You're going to say, oh, I wish I mentioned something. I wish I did something. He goes, but that's part of what we do. You're not going to be able to remember everything on the stand. And you're going to think of the great answer once you're in the car. But you can't beat yourself up because that's how you learn and just move on with it. And so I've tried to do that. And enjoyed the successes. And when the uh, um, clients tell me I did great, and I tried to ignore the people that, you know, they're very, very few um, that don't like me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but I always, you know, so I just try, I think that helps a lot because you can beat yourself up and, you know, on every aspect of your life. So that's it. That's what I think. Yeah, isn't that always the case, though, right? We're always our own worst worst critic, which is why it's important to surround yourself with um, peers and colleagues who are going to give you the pat on the back and be like, no, you rocked it. It's good. Any other advice to offer young women professionals? Breathe, transpire, and ambition your dreams every single day. You have, if it's your passion, if it's your dream, don't let any minor or major obstacle get in your way. Just determination. Keep going. It doesn't matter if it's because you are a single mom and just, just you don't have a support system. You feel like the world is going to crush against you. Just like keep, keep trying to pursue your dream. So breathe, transpire, and ambition every single day, every single second. Paula. Be nice. That's the most thing you can do in your life is to be nice to everyone you meet, no matter who they are and at what level, be nice. I like it. Those, again, great life lessons in and out of, you know, the corporate world. I would add um, that you're, you are so your biggest supporter. You have to do what's best for you. So you might find yourself in, in a situation where they want to you want to stay with a certain company or you want to stay in a certain situation but maybe it's not what's best for you and what you might define as success so you have to do what is best for you we might have the best support system around around us but you're really your biggest supporter so stay true to yourself and, and do what's best for you yeah i like that aubrey goes back to that authenticity surround yourself with your people but you have to have your own back too and and I would also add to that, that if you do your homework, right, get when you have that that passion around it, do your homework, understand what the limitations or the challenges that are going to be as, me, as best you can. Um, when you take those positions, nobody told me when I started my first career at CDC that it literally was a job you were on 24 seven. Nobody let me know that. Nobody let me know that there would be a 4 a.m. phone call and I'd have to go rushing out the door. And I wish I had known that because maybe I would have made some different choices. Did I make some really good ones? Yes. And I wanted to be there and I wanted to do those things. But I had to do my homework when I did that. And I had to do the homework on all the other jobs that I've taken. The other part of that too is be your own best negotiator. I think we forget that as women that when we get a job offer. Um, we don't always negotiate. We're always so grateful or so happy or think it's wonderful, but don't rely, as as Aubrey said, you, you're you. You've got to make the right choices for you and don't forget to negotiate. You're just as strong as everybody else and you count just as much. No, oh, that's great, Allison. You know, one thing that um, Sarah Richter and I spend a lot of time talking about from a corporate perspective is the importance of communications. But um, as, as I hear everybody sharing their thoughts around the table in terms of advice, one piece of advice I think I would offer any young professional is don't underestimate the importance of communication. I think that so many times, whether it's a client being unhappy or if you um, have a disagreement with a colleague, your child, your spouse, your friend, nine out of 10 times, it's a breakdown in communication. And um, there's just seems to be this over dependence on the digital world these days where 
you can't construe tone over an email or tone over a text, or you don't take the time maybe to explain the why behind what you're doing or what you're doing. I found that 99% of my challenges in life have been solved simply by talking to somebody. And again, going back to that authenticity and explaining to them, hey, this was the intent. This is what was meant. This is why. And once you can, I think, communicate with somebody on that one on one level, it really helps navigating through life in general a lot easier and certainly in a corporate environment. And I know that we're all coming off of a two year pandemic where um, there are people on, on, on this call that, you know, I maybe have only met once or twice. And we rely on this virtual platform and it's almost dehumanizing, right? It's so clinical. You get on these meetings, you have agenda items and you don't have the opportunity to get to know each other. So to me, um, just focusing and making communication a priority will really help, I think, with anybody embarking on, on their career. I would say to those those girls and those women looking to to start a career in math and science or engineering, accounting, don't feel you have to blend in, be who you are, because it will surprise you how many other people who think very similarly to you start coming out of the woodwork where they were trying to blend in. But once they see you take that first step and shine and be who you are and wear what you want to wear and listen to music you want to listen to and say what you want to say, it'll be interesting to see that you just by you taking care of yourself and giving yourself that voice, you're inspiring others to do the same. And I would say too, um, Emily, um, uh, what Emily had mentioned is that one of the things I was also told as advice was that when you're with clients, you know, try to have that personal connection with them, you know, so you're not the clinical, like what Monica was referring to earlier, because you have a personal connection or you can share a story and say, oh, I just went skiing or um, my child just played in the baseball game or, you know, go Rams, you know, Super Bowl just happened. Then they remember that you are a football fan or they remember that you like to dance or whatever. And then the next time you talk to them, they can put the face better with the name. I mean, especially since we do do, I think what we do is all very exciting, but you know, numbers and engineering, it can get a little mundane. So you have to bring out something different. So they remember you and they're not just thinking of you as just the damage expert. They're like, Oh, it's Jenny, the damage expert, but she's went to, you know, she's been skiing and, so it's great story. So I always tell my my girls, my triplet girls, that they I half my career I should owe to them because every single client knows I have them, and they always ask me about them. Oh my gosh, how are the girls? I'm like, oh, they're 14. Oh, they can't be 14. So that's the one thing that's you know got me through. Thank you all so much. I I. What a great conversation, uh, Monica. Thank you for leading the panel. All of you, thank you so much for your time today um, and, and letting us get to know you a little bit better um, and sharing some great wisdom, uh, lessons and advice for um, our team and for young women who um, are you know, in their career, maybe transitioning. And hopefully this could inspire someone to, um, to take that next big step in their life. For everyone listening, um, to learn more about our guests, please visit our website, jshell.com. And uh, let me just close again with a you know, tremendous thank you. Um, and I, we look forward to talking to all of you again in the future. Mm -hmm.